Buying a home isn't easy, but the good news? Quest Mortgage makes the mortgage process straightforward, stress-free, and entirely online. And with a better rate mortgage, you can own your home without it owning you. Visit questmortgage.com to learn more. Welcome to the new way to mortgage. Welcome to Amazing Business Radio with best-selling author and customer service and business expert, Shep Hyken. Shep will talk with some of the smartest thinkers in business to help make you more successful in your professional and personal life. This is Amazing Business Radio with Shep Hyken. Hello, everybody. It's Shep Hyken here. We're back with another episode of Amazing Business Radio. I have a very interesting guest today, Anita Toth. Are you ready for this title? Chief Churn Crusher at Anita Toth Inc. And she focuses on helping companies understand their customers better. She does research with them. She does interviews. She does surveys. We'll talk with her in just a moment. Uh, Before we get into the interview, if you've got an amazing story that you want to share or a question that you'd like to ask, be sure to reach out to me on any of the social media channels. And if it is a question, use the hashtag ask Shep, I'll answer it there uh, in the social channel, on this show, maybe in my newsletter, or on my TV show, Be Amazing or Go Home. And that can be seen on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Prime, and you can see episodes at BeAmazing.tv. That's BeAmazing.tv. All right, let's get into the interview. Anita, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Shep. Happy to be here. Well, I'm happy you are here. You have a great company up in Toronto, Canada, or near Toronto. Everything's near Toronto. If you're where are you from, Toronto, but not really. Am I right? Um, I'm about an hour's drive. That's what I'm talking Toronto. about. Everybody's so, yeah, a right. drive from Toronto, and uh, you have uh, started a great company. You have a lot of research uh, background, working with companies, qualitative research to more or less find out the opinions of customers, and you've taken this to your own business, and I'm excited to talk to you about what you're learning and, and best practices that we can share with our audience. So one of the cool talking points that you sent over, and let's just jump right into it, is the customer journey is like a romantic relationship. Furthermore, uh, it's like marketing and sales is like dating while the post-sale side is like marriage. And uh, I just know it it takes a lot to get, uh, it took a lot to get my wife and now it takes a lot to keep her. And you know, by the way, they're different skills. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, they they absolutely are. And I think um, most people don't stop to think that, the customer company relationship is still a relationship. So you get into the marketing, the sales, it's like dating. It's tactical. It's fun. You're talking to lots of people. Maybe something will work out. Let's see. And then, you know, you have the wedding, which is when they become a customer. So they move from prospect to customer. You have a little honeymoon period, which on the, I work with customer success teams in uh, SaaS companies, software as a service companies. They have the onboarding phase. So that's kind of like the honeymoon, which may or may not go well. And then you have, which is the bulk of the relationship, the marriage, the customer company relationship that is non-tactical. And yeah, you have to use different ways to build the relationship to maintain it and to keep that trust going. It's, it doesn't just, you know, it's not just a one and done thing. And um, I'm trying to get companies to, to think of it this way, that whatever they did in marketing and sales, they can't continue once the customer becomes a customer. It's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's an old joke. It's a story. Some people may have heard it. I may have even shared it several years ago. But it's a story about a guy dies and goes to heaven and he's at the pearly gates and St. Peter says, hey, we're doing things different now. You qualify for heaven, but we'd like you to have uh, uh, the opportunity to to see what else is available. So if you'd like to check out what's down below, uh, we'll give you that option. And the gentleman said, you know what, it's not that I wouldn't want to be in heaven, but sure, I'd like to check out my options. And with that, St. Lucifer appears and takes him downstairs Uh, where he experiences hell. And he sees all these people dancing on tables and having this great time, just having so much fun. And he thinks about it, he goes back upstairs and he says to St. Peter, I go, you know, I love it up here. It's tranquil, it's melodic. I hear the harp music, but I'm a party man. And I think maybe that's where I'd like to spend eternity. And with that, St. Lucifer takes him downstairs, puts him into a small room, chains him to the wall and says, here you are. And he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, just a little while ago, 
uh, we were dancing. We were having a good time. He goes, yeah, just a little while ago, you were a prospect. Now you're a customer. <laughs> okay. So I don't know if that's a good story or not. Uh, I don't know if it's politically correct or not, but I think it makes the point that you're trying to say is that, you know, what happens pre-sale and then eventually the sale happens. And I want to talk about this honeymoon uh, period. You and I have a mutual friend, John Rulin. Okay. John's the giftologist. John and I have a mutual friend that you may know, Joey Coleman. Do you know Joey? Yeah. Okay. You yeah. do. Yes. Now you're nodding your head. Yes. But the rest of the people listening can't see that. So I'm going to tell them she's nodding her head. Yeah. Joey wrote an incredible book called The First 100 Days, or it's it's about the first 100 days. Uh, the book is titled Never Lose a Customer Again. Uh, but uh, it's all about the first 100 days. What happens after somebody decides to do business with you? Now, I have this personal feeling that customer service is built into every aspect of the journey from even thinking about doing business with you to actually talking to somebody about doing business with you to finally doing business with you and everything that happens after that. But that first 100 days, I think, is your honeymoon period. That's where you validate, made the right decision to get married, to do business with you. So let's talk about that honeymoon. What do you, what's your take on that? Absolutely. First of all, it's a great book. I've read it. If anyone hasn't read it, I would recommend grabbing Highly that book and reading it. It's awesome. Um, the other thing is the honeymoon period is where you find out, much like uh, the joke that you told, whether your expectations actually meet reality. And they can meet reality, they can exceed them, or you can find out, oh, wait a minute here, yeah, <laughs> much, like, much like in your joke, <laughs> hey, this is not at all what I expected. So really, those are the, the three ways it can go. And uh, so, you know, we focus on customer retention. That's that's what we do. The seeds of churn, the seeds of doubt, all of that are planted right in that honeymoon phase. So if customers you know, right in the beginning are starting to feel like, ah, I'm not really sure this was a great decision. It's it's kind of like turning a massive ship around in the ocean. It takes a lot of effort to make that happen. So the closer your marketing and sales can keep the expectations to the reality of being a customer, all, right there, you've uh, made the customer experience better. And You've uh, you've made a dent in in all the effort you have to do to retain those unhappy customers. Right. Well, I, the first thing is try to avoid to have those unhappy customers to begin with and create the expectation that's realistic. Uh, but that first 100 days to Joey is crucial. That's when there's some follow up. There's some onboarding. And I know as a customer success expert, which is one of the areas that you focus on, that's what what it's about is can we get this customer to be successful with their purchase, whether it be software, whether it be a car. Uh, I remember sitting in the passenger seat while the uh, uh, guy who sold me my car went over different features. And then we switched and he said, now let's see if you remember what I told you. <laughs> and then he, the, the lesson continued. And he says, I have a feeling there's a lot of electronics on this car. I have a feeling you're gonna be coming back to visit me in the next few days. Just wanna let you know when I'm available. And then three days later, he calls to say, hey, I'm making sure that you know uh, or that you were able to do everything we talked. I mean, it was just a wonderful onboarding experience. And that's the way it should be with any type of company. What can we do to make sure that they have success with whatever it is that we sell them? Yeah. And success is a feeling as much it as is. it is. Yeah, very outcome, good. Success is that's tweetable. Feeling. Yeah. Success isn't just success. It's a feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, if you make your customer feel successful, guess what? They feel good about you. Yep. Yep. Even if they didn't get the results they expected. And I've had that happen where I have um, bought software and went to, you know, whatever, onboard myself, adopt it, try it out. I wasn't successful, but I reached out to their customer support team and um, I walked away feeling like I was valued that they were there to help me rather than just, you know, check, uh, checking off a box. And so I went back and even though I didn't have success with it and at that moment, um, I felt really good about the interaction that helped, had me try again. 
So how many yeah. times have we had it where we've contacted customer support? We want to, you know, cancel our account. We want to refund, whatever. If you really feel valued through that interaction, sometimes you change your mind and go, okay, maybe, maybe I'll give it another try. Well, and I'll tell you, uh, there's a, I'm, another story. This is a true story. It happened to me. Um, I was working with the, uh, using a company software, had been using it for many years. I wasn't getting out of it what I wanted to get out of it. Um, I found a better solution for me. And it's not that they're a better company. This company is a great company. I had just signed my year agreement with them. It's a contract. And I thought, well, it's only been a month. Maybe they'll let me out of it. Maybe they'll prorate it, whatever. And the answer was no, they wouldn't. They were very nice about it, explaining why. The CEO got on the phone with me. I actually got on the phone with me. And he said, and by the way, this is a pretty big company. He said, uh, I'll tell you what, Jeff, I know who you are. I believe we're the right software company for you, but here's what I want you to do. I'm going to set you up with one-on-ones with their best people. And if after a couple of months of working with them, you haven't decided we're the right solution, I'm going to end the contract, but you've got to try. I went, wow. Well, and after a few months, you know, we ended, but Here's the thing. I've still I'm still recommending that company to all of the people that need what they do. So it's they ended so strong. Yeah. And that's a company then that really values that relationship. We've we know when, you know, we're just a number. You can yeah, you can viscerally feel it versus going that extra mile to say, hey, we really value our relationship. Let's try and see what we can do you know, with like, that's, that's a huge commitment, even on his part to dedicate people to work with you to see if you can, you know, achieve that success that you were hoping to achieve. Well, do you know, I've probably recommended more people to them since I've stopped doing business with them than when I was doing business with them. I think that's like the ultimate definition of ending strong. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It is. It is. I, I, love I may, that story, I may have to write way. an article about that. Well, that's a good one. I've never, written, but that's, it's a, it would be a great story. You know, it, it's like, I stopped doing business with the company because it wasn't right for me, but I, I love them even more now that I've stopped. <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have, um, I did write about my experience with this company and same thing, software company, actually my business model changed. And it was one of the first times where I actually felt so weird. I actually felt bad about no longer being a customer. And a part of me wanted to continue to financially support them because my experience was so good. And same thing. I I talk about them all the time. I recommend them all the time um, because they really made me feel valued. And and I think that that's, we, we fail to talk about this. We talk about what the customer wants, what they need, what they think, but decisions are based on feelings, that feeling of success, the feeling of failure, the feeling of being valued, the feeling of not being valued. And that's the one piece we tend to dance around because it's hard to quantify. Right. Uh, it's easy to quantify ROI. Right. It's a number. And by the way, the C-suite wants numbers. However, you're never going to long-term have a relationship with a company that's just numbers. There's got to be some emotional connection because otherwise, uh, if there's not, you open yourself up to competition coming in that can make you feel good about doing business with them beyond just numbers. Yep. Uh, I think that's important uh, to point out. L- let's take a short break. We've talked about uh, the honeymoon phase, the differences between courting and marrying uh, your your customers. I think that's a really important lesson. Uh, we've just been talking about, you know, th- the importance of ending strong, which, by the way, none of this is on the sheet, the, the, the talking points that I have here. But when we come back, I want to talk about this really cool title that you have, and you are the Chief Churn Crusher. I love that title. I also want to talk about monologues versus dialogues, which is what you need in a good customer experience program. We're going to take a short break. We are talking with Anita Toth, who is the chief churn crusher at Anita Toth, Inc. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Let's talk about Text Expander, a tool that allows your team to eliminate repetitive typing with just a few keystrokes. Anything you type over and over, such as customer responses, will be at your team's fingertips so they have the power to do what they do best, just faster. 
quickly reply to emails and chats from a library of responses that you create, completing answers to common questions and issues. Your entire team stays on the same page with the same common responses that can be personalized on the fly. And it's simple to use. Type commonly used content into a text expander snippet and give it an abbreviation of just a few letters and symbols. Share the snippet with the team. When you type the abbreviation, it triggers the snippet and the content expands anywhere you type, including email, chat, or social media. It's that easy. Just go to www.textexpander.com to learn more about this amazing and productive tool. Sign up for a year and get 20% off. You're listening to Amazing Business Radio with best-selling author and customer service and business expert, Shep Hyken. We're back on Amazing Business Radio talking with Anita Toth, the chief churn crusher. So that's where I want to go first. I love this title. By the way, do you know what my title is? No. Chief <laughs> Amazement Officer. Uh, I, should, I love I, that. I should know that. I should know <laughs> that. It ties in with the title of the of the show. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The amazing Business Radio. I've written the book, Be Amazing or Go Home. Uh Amaze every customer every time. It's, I, I, amaze is in my DNA. And uh, but this is not about my title, it's about yours. And by the way, just recently I've seen a number of articles about creative titles that kind of uh it, it it is a little whimsical, uh, no doubt, which I think kind of gives people the idea of when they deal with you, they're gonna probably be dealing with somebody that's not, you know, uh I'm I I shouldn't say normal because you are normal, but you know what I mean? It's like you're a little, it's something special. Maybe that's the right word. So talk to me about how you came up with that and why that's relevant to you and your business. Okay. So if you can believe it, three simple words, chief churn crusher took me six months to dial that in. And I was really inspired by the Home Depot's old slogan. You can do it. We can help. So I wanted to be able to to express in as few words as possible who my ideal uh, uh, client is for our business and also explain what we did. So what's the outcome? And it took me, I anyway, played in the thesaurus forever, figuring it out, working on it, working on it. So I got Churn Crusher and then I was like, well, I want this to be alliterative, alliterative. So chief churn crusher. And then everyone in the company is also a churn crusher. I just happen to be the chief, the churn, chief crusher. churn crusher. Our goal is to crush your churn. I love it. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. And who doesn't want that? Right. I right, know right. like even customers do. Like I be when I become a customer, it's because I I, you know, I want to stay. I don't really want to leave. It's a hassle to to leave after you become a customer, especially if you're buying software and you've implemented. So yeah, crushing churn is important, not just for the company, but also for the customer too. So, you know, I, I can see if I'm sitting next to you on an airplane, I say, can you tell me what you do? You know, like, hey, I, my name's Shep. What's your name? My name's Anita. Nice to meet you, Anita. So what do you do, Anita? And you say, oh, I'm a chief churn crusher. What's that mean? And then you explain, you know, well, how do you do that? And that's like the next question, right? And it's like, oh, I'm glad you asked. How much money do you have in your bank account to send me? No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> but that's what you do for a living. You, you help companies do that. So uh, can you, as almost succinctly, maybe three sentences instead of three words, tell us how you crush churn? So uh, we use voice of the customer. That, okay, that's voice of the, that's four words. No, that's one sentence. That's one. We use voice <laughs> of the customer. That's great. Okay. We use voice of the customer. We help our clients build strategies. We use education and research. So it's actually doing interviews, focus groups, surveys on behalf of our clients to help them get either validation or those deep insights that they've been missing so that they can crush their churn, retain All right, their now customers that, longer. That sounded like a long answer. But I was listening very closely. You had two really short sentences and one really, really long one with lots of commas and ands and so's. So it qualifies as a three sentence answer. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> that's great. And I think that's going to lead us right into monologues versus dialogues because a monologue is a survey. A dialogue is really listening and having a conversation with the customer to understand what's going on in their world. So let's talk about that since that's really what your background is and so much of what you do with your clients. Absolutely. So um, 
if you think about it, what's a monologue? Well, it's just a one way. It's not even a conversation. You can't call it a conversation. It's a one one way transfer of information. And uh, what we do with Voice of the Customer is help help people see that they need both. You, surveys are great. You want to send something out over a large group of people, get some feedback. This is wonderful, but you, you really don't have much context to them. Why people responded as they did with a dialogue, just like we're having here, you can ask further questions. You can ask what led to the decision. You can ask how they felt, what they thought, what they had to do when something did or didn't work out. And th that's where the really deep insights are. The challenge, of course, with having a dialogue is that it's one on one or even with a focus group, you might have, you know, one to a smaller group of people. So you're getting a lot of depth, but it's resource and time intensive versus a survey it takes no time at all. You can put it out to a lot of people, but you don't have the same depth. Right. I get it. So how many people do you need to interview to get really good data? Um is a is a focus group of five people enough? Do you need fifty? Do you need five hundred? What's what's a good number? Hey, I, I hate this response when people say this. It depends on what your goal is. Mm -hmm. It really does. So if you want to do interviews, we always recommend a minimum of minimum of fifteen. And the reason being is you want to make sure that the people that you've chosen and the results you're seeing, you're starting to see some patterns. So really, that's the key. And same with the focus group, 10 to 15 people. Anything more than that becomes unwieldy. Um, but you want to get enough people in the room that you can start seeing, okay, three or four people said this. Is this a pattern? Then you can take that information and go out and survey your customers to see, is this valid? Is this valid across a larger part of our customer base? So the qualitative uh, responses actually lead you to creating a survey that gives you quantitative responses. Yeah. Really interesting. And our, so I'm going to drill down a little bit more on the types of people you're talking to and interviewing. Do you want to try to get similar customers? Or are you looking for a variety or do you suggest, look, you've got three different kinds of customers. You've got customers that are all in. You've got, I'm just making this up. I mean, whatever the three types are, maybe there's seven types. I don't know. Would you recommend putting the different, ones in a group together, separating them, what works best? So it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. One of the big things- uh, There's that, are, that are, answer again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the, the big things that um, our clients uh, come to us for is they do not understand the difference in their customer segments. Oh, okay. So let's interview your best customers, 15, 20 of those. Let's interview that big bulk of customers that are kind of in the middle. And mm -hmm. then let's interview those who are either at risk of churning or have churned. What are the differences, differences and similarities between those three groups? What are they looking to achieve that's similar or different? How are they different in how they perceive their problem and your solution? So that's, that's really one of the, the basic things. Focus groups are a little different. You do want a mix of people. Sometimes in the same room, sometimes you want to separate them out into smaller groups, but definitely one of the best places to start seeing like, whoa, we have this customer group right here, our best customers, we find that they do this, 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 and this. Okay, we found this out through the interviews. Now let's use the surveys to validate. And if you're seeing those patterns being confirmed, what do we need to do to take these people in the middle and start moving them up? What what are they doing differently? How do they behave differently? How do they think differently? And start, you know, seeing how, you know, put a plan in place. How can we move them from this sort of, you know, middle ground, which is actually the most at risk um, of leaving because you often don't know. Right, you don't know, you know which direction they're headed. Nope, you have no clue. So it starts helping you to create a strategy to then start moving people up from that middle ground into that, hey, this is what our best customers do, how they think, how they feel. And um, it's it's incredibly powerful. But you got to interview them. You got to ask. Surveys, monologues are not enough. Do you have a favorite question uh, that's like, this is the question that every client or every customer needs to be asked? Yes. And it's not a question. It is a statement. And it, it starts like this. Tell me more. Tell me more about how you felt. Tell me more about 
what you had to do. Tell, so it's actually not a question. It's a statement. Tell me more. But and it that pushes gets, them to give you clarity and yeah. a more definitive response. And, and uh, yeah. it's very, it's non-threatening. When you ask the question, one of the, the worst questions to ask is, why did you do that? Why? Because it harkens back to when we were kids and we yeah, were being defensive. admonished. It's defensive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. By, by parents, by teachers. Why did you do that? Oh, I don't know. But if you come to, come and ask people, well, tell me more about that. And in that type of tone from curiosity, like a base of curiosity, people open up. Yeah. Like, like the stuff that we hear is mind blowing in these interviews, even sometimes personal things that you're like, whoa, I had no idea we were going here. But that's what you want to learn. What's also going on in their personal life that's affecting their decisions as your customer? Uh, so this is powerful. This is solid gold information. Um, I really love your approach to it all. We are pretty much out of time. And you know the question that's coming. I have the one thing question. What's the one thing you want to share with our audience? You've given us some great wisdom uh, about the conversations we need to be having with our customers, both dialogues and monologues. Uh, we've talked about that uh, romantic relationship we have. We talked about those first 100 days, thanks to Joey Coleman. I really would love to have spent a little bit more time talking about avoiding buyer's remorse, but it'll take us right back to the, you know, what happens in that honeymoon period. What's the one thing, though, one last nugget of information? Okay, so it's a little card I have on my desk. Uh, you can't see it, but I'm going to describe it to you. So it's a business card on the back. It's red. And on the front, it's white with two words written in ca uh, their capitalized and bold. And it says, stop talking. Start I just did. Listening. I just did for a moment. It became very awkward. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> it became awkward, but that's the whole point. If you really want to, to deliver those amazing customer experiences and move customers from, you know, feeling like they're not valued, they made the wrong decision. Stop talking and start listening, start listening to not only what, what they're saying, start asking them about their feelings. Start Tell finding me more. out. Tell me, tell me more. <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. And then tell me more and then stop talking. <laughs> let, the, <laughs> let them fill in the rest. Well, this has been great. Thanks so much for being on the show. This is why we call it Amazing Business Radio. You've given us some great insights. Much appreciated. Thank you. Oh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Shep. I really, I really enjoyed being here. Well, me too. Thanks. So, all right, everybody, that wraps it up. Another episode of Amazing Business Radio. We will be back next week with another interview. I hope you tune in. Until that time, this is Shep Hyken reminding you to always be amazing. <laughs>